Well, hello there. Happy flying to you all. Did you ever have one of those aha moments where something became really clear to you that you weren't expecting to learn? I had one of those recently after talking with a few new drone pilots about drones and flying. We had some great conversations, but this one thing kept coming up that just blew my mind. And I'm going to share it with you. Holy hell, it's cold out here. Let's take this into the warmth, shall we? It's a little dark in here. Let's go. Ah, uh, no, that's better. Good to see your smiling faces again. Now, where were we again? Oh, yeah. So when our discussion did turn to the FAA and stupid drone rules, as it usually does at some point, sorry FAA, we talk about things like the trust certificate, controlled airspace, BV loss, you know, the things that drone pilots tend to complain about when they get together. And the comment that I kept hearing was, well, that's why I bought this mini drone, so I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. And of course, I would always follow up by saying something like, you know you still have to follow the recreational rule sets, like taking the trust test, following a CBO, Lance authorizations, flying within visual line of sight, and stuff like that. And I kept getting that same blank stare back. You know which one I mean. You should draw my words. And when I did get a response, it was usually delayed, but then it went something like, well, what's a trust certificate and where do I get that anyway? So today we're going to dig into the recreational rules for mini drones, and all recreational drones for that matter. And I'm going to break it down so that it's simple. And even if you're already familiar with the rules, I think you'll learn something too. So stick around. One of the difficulties that there is with recreational rules is that Congress passed the 44809 exception for recreational flyers. And it was nine simple rules. And that's the operative rule here. Simple. But, but the FAA then got to add their two cents. And they did that in this sneaky rule number two, which talks about following CBO rules. And the FAA got to complicate this even further by creating guidelines that would be required to be followed if you wanted to be an approved CBO. So of course, the FAA made the CBO requirements overly complicated. And in addition, there are multiple CBOs now. So the rules for recreational flyers could be different for you compared to somebody that's flying right next to you. So are you confused yet? Okay, so let's simplify this with my own outline of the rules for recreational flyers just once and for all. I'm also going to leave a link for a one-page summary of the rules that I'll be talking about today, a cheat sheet, if you will, so that you can download that and have it with you for future reference. So get your pad and paper. You're going to want to take notes. First and foremost, the most important rule is that you must qualify to be a recreational flyer. And that means, one, that you must fly for fun only. Anything other than fun is not recreational, and it is part 107 by definition. Number two, you're going to need to follow the rules of a CBO. And to make this simpler, I'm going to choose a CBO so that we're talking about the same one here. And I'm going to choose the one that I think is the simplest after reviewing all of these CBOs. And the CBO is the FPV Freedom Coalition. And don't worry if you're not flying FPV, this still applies as well. So here are the rules of the CBO that we're going to need to follow as part of this rule number two. A. Check the flight area for TFRs, temporary flight restrictions. Keep in mind that this is different than normal controlled airspace, like around an airport. The best way I've found is using an app like Airloft Air Control. TFRs will usually show up as controlled airspace, as shown here, but it's not perfect, so use common sense as well. If the president is coming to your town, don't try and fly a drone overhead, even if it isn't showing up here. B. Perform a pre-flight inspection to ensure the aircraft is operating properly and not damaged. C. Announce when powering on the aircraft. Yeah, that's an odd one. I'm launching over here. D. Verify the fail-safe condition. In most situations, this means setting the return to home parameters or knowing how to shut the motors off in case of an emergency. E. Do a visual survey of the flight area. Now, this is typically to identify obstacles, people, and even an alternative landing area in case you need to make an emergency landing. F. No flights over people are allowed. G. Don't disrupt or pose a danger to emergency response efforts, areas where crowds of people gather, or civil infrastructure, including like power, water, and transportation facilities. H. For night flights, this CBO states that the ambient light must be adequate for the pilot in command, the person manipulating the controls, or the visual observer to see the aircraft without visual aids. This means in all practicality that you can't fly in complete darkness according to this CBO. Now, I'm going to add another interpretation here, which actually comes from the 44809 rule set itself. And it's detailed in the Advisory Circular 91-57C. And it states that in the darkness, 
anti-collision strobe lights, and other lighting indicating orientation and flight path need to be attached to the OS. So if you want to fly in the darkness, and since the CBO doesn't specifically address this, I think in this situation, it's fair to follow the guidance of the 9157C, and you should be just fine. I. They recommend no drinking, drugs, or taking medications that interfere with the pilot's ability to operate the UAS safely. Now, that is it for the sneaky rule number two of the CBO rules. So, let's finish up with the remaining FAA rules. Now, this continues with rule number three. Keep your drone within visual line of sight. So, that means no BV loss, no beyond visual line of sight flying. Four, give way and do not interfere with other aircraft. Five, fly at or below FAA authorized altitudes in controlled airspace. Only do so with prior FAA authorization using lands or drone zone. Six, Fly at or below 400 feet in Class G or uncontrolled airspace. Seven, take the Recreational UIS Safety Test or the Trust Test and carry proof of a test passage when flying. And before I forget, make sure you click that like button if you found any value so far. I really do appreciate it. Number eight, register your drones and have a current FAA registration mark on your drone. Of course, below 250 grams and for recreation only, you do not need to register, but if you do, you'll also need remote ID. Number nine, do not operate your drone in a manner that endangers the safety of the national airspace system. And that's it, according to the FAA. Easy, right? Well, before you click away, one thing you need to keep in mind is that this covers FAA federal type rules. But if your local or state laws have additional restrictions on where you can land or launch from, you'll need to do some local research to make sure you don't have an ordinance or something like that that will be a problem for you. I did do a video a few years ago showing a deep dive in an area, how I found the local restrictions and rules and ordinances, and it is still a really good example on how this can be done. Now keep in mind that this example was a horrible worst case scenario. Your research will probably be much easier and faster, but this gives you a good idea of a process that you can follow to check it out. Now one great resource that's available now that wasn't available when I did that video is a wiki page that Pilot Institute created and that's a really good start to check local regulations and state laws and things as well. And I'll leave links up here so you can go check that out. Now, since I mentioned Pilot Institute, they really are the only place to go if you're considering a Part 107 certificate or even just want to know what the Part 107 does for you. And I did do a video that you might want to take a look at. And I'll put that up here. And it'll probably answer a lot of your questions. And lastly, do you know what documentation you need to carry with you when you're flying your drone in case you're approached by a law enforcement or FAA official? Well, if not... I'll see you soon in this video. Till then, good flying. And I did do a video with, and I did do a, and I did do a video with, 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 good flying.